Hi, I'm Pumpkin Otter. Today we're reading Sherlock Holmes, The Hound of the Baskerville by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. We originally did this reading live on Twitch. If you'd like to check out my Twitch channel for more live readings, please see the description box below for the link. Thank you so much. Enjoy. Chapter 8. First report of Dr. Watson. From this point onward, I will follow the course of events by just transcribing my own letters to Mr. Sherlock Holmes, which lie before me on the table. One page is missing, but otherwise they are exactly as written and show my feelings and suspicions of the moment more accurate than my memory. Clear as it is upon these tragic events can possibly do. Baskerville Hall, October 13th. My dear Holmes, my previous letters and telegrams have kept you pretty well up to date as to all that has occurred in this most God-forsaken corner of the world. The longer one stays here, the more does the spirit of the more sink into one's soul. I like that. The more does the spirit of the more. It's funny. Sink into one's soul. Its vastness and also its grim charm. When you are once out upon its blossom, you have left all traces of modern England behind you. But, on the other hand, you are conscious everywhere of the homes and the work of the prehistoric people. On all sides of you is... You walk are the houses of these forgotten folk, with their graves and the huge monoliths which are supposed to have marked their temples. As you look at their gray stone huts against the scarred hillsides, you leave your own age behind you. And if you were able to see a skin-clad hairy man crawl out from the low door, fitting a flint-trapped arrow on the string of his bow, you would feel that his presence there was more natural than your own. The strange thing is that they should have lived so thickly on what must always have been most unfruitful soil. I am no antiquarian, but I could imagine that they were some unwarlike and harried race who were forced to accept that which none others would occupy. All this, however, is foreign to the mission on which you sent me and will probably be very uninteresting to your severely practical mind. I can still remember your complete indifference as to whether the sun moved around the earth or the earth round the sun. Let me, therefore, return to the facts concerning Sir Henry Baskerville. If you had not had any report within the last few days, it is because up to today there was nothing of importance to relate. Then a very surprising circumstance occurred, which I shall tell you in due course. But first of all, I must keep you in touch with some of the other factors in this situation. One of these, concerning which I have said little, is the escaped convict upon the moor. There is a strong reason now to believe that he has got right away, which is a considerable relief to the lonely householders of this district. A fortnight has passed since his last flight, during which he had not been seen and nothing has been heard of him. It is surely inconceivable that he could have held out upon the moor during all that time. Of course, so far as his concealment goes, there is no difficulty at all. Any one of these stone huts would give him a hiding place, but there is nothing to eat unless he were to catch and slaughter one of the moor sheep. We think, therefore, that he is gone, and that outlying farmers sleep the better in consequence. We are four able-bodied men in this household, so that we could take care, we could take good care of ourselves. But I confess that I've had some uneasy moments when I have thought of the Stapletons. They live miles from any help. There are one maid, an old manservant, the sister and the brother. The latter, not a very strong man. They would be helpless in the hands of a desperate fellow like this Notting Hill criminal if he could once effect an entrance. Both Sir Henry and I were concerned at their situation, and it was suggested that Perkins the groom should go over to sleep there, but Stapleton would not hear of it. The fact is that our friend, the baronet, begins to display a considerable interest in our fair neighbor. It is not to be wondered at, for time hangs heavily in this lonely spot to an active man like him, and she is a very fascinating and beautiful woman. There is something tropical and exotic about her, which forms a singular contrast to her cool and unemotional brother. Yet, he also gives the idea of hidden fires. 
he has certainly a very marked influence over her, for I have seen her continually glance at him as she talked as if seeking approbations for what she said. I trust that he is kind to her. There is a dry glitter in his eyes and a firm set of his thin lips, which goes with a positive and possibly a harsh nature. You would find him an interesting study. He came over to call upon Baskerville on the first day, and the very next morning he took us both to show us the spot where the legend of the wicked Hugo is supposed to have had its origin. It was an excursion of some miles across the moor to a place which is so dismal that it might have suggested the story. We found a short valley between rugged tours which led to an open, grassy space, flecked over with the white cotton grass. In the middle of it rose two great stones, worn and sharpened at the upper end until they looked like the huge corroding fangs of some monstrous beast. In every way, it corresponded with the scene of the old tragedy. Sir Henry was much more interested and asked Stapleton more than once whether he did really believe in the possibility of the interference of the supernatural in the affairs of men. He spoke lightly, but it was evident that he was very much in earnest. Stapleton was guarded in his replies, but it was easy to see that he could to see that he said less than he might, and that he would not express his whole opinion out of consideration for the feelings of the baronet. He told us of similar cases, where families had suffered some evil influence, and he left us with the impression that he shared the popular view upon the matter. On our way back, we stayed for lunch at Merripit House, and it was there that Sir Henry made the acquaintance of Miss Stapleton. From the first moment that he saw her, he appeared to be strongly attracted to her, and I am much mistaken if the feelings were not mutual. He referred to her again and again on our walk home, and since then hardly a day has passed that we have not seen something of the brother and sister. They dine here tonight, and there is some talk of our going to them next week. One would imagine that such a match would be very welcome to Stapleton, and yet... I have more than once caught a look of the strongest disapprobation in his face when Sir Henry has been paying some attention to his sister. He is much attached to her, no doubt, and would lead a lonely life without her, but it would seem the height of selfishness if he were to stand in the way of her making so brilliant a marriage. Yet, I am certain that he does not wish their intimacy to ripen into love and I have several times observed that he has taken pains to prevent them from being a tititete. By the way, your instruction to me to never allow Sir Henry to go out alone will become a very much more onerous if a love affair were to be added to our other difficulties. My popularity would soon suffer if I were to carry out your orders to the letter. The other day, Thursday to be more exact, Dr. Mortimer lunched with us. He has been excavating a barrow at Long Down and has got a prehistoric skull which fills him with great joy. Never was there such a single-minded enthusiast as he. The Stapletons came in afterward, and the good doctor took us all to the U Alley at Sir Henry's request to show us exactly how everything to show us exactly how everything had occurred upon that fatal night. It is a long, dismal walk. The yew alley, between two high walls of clipped hedge, with a narrow band of grass upon either side. At the far end is an old tumble-down summer house. Halfway down is the moor gate, where the old gentleman left his cigar ash. It has a white wooden gate with a latch. Beyond it lies the wide moor. I remembered your theory of the affair and tried to picture all that had occurred. As the old man stood there, he saw something coming across the moor, something which terrified him, so that he lost his wits and ran and ran until he died of sheer horror and exhaustion. There was a long, gloomy tunnel down which he had fled, and from what? A sheepdog on the moor? Or a spectral hound, black, silent, and monstrous? Was there a human agency in the matter? Did the pale, watchful Barrymore know more than he cared to say? It was all dim and vague. But 
always there is the dark shadow of crime behind it. One other neighbor I've met since I wrote last. This is Mr. Franklin of Laughter Hall, who lives some four miles to the south of us. He is an elderly man, red-faced, white-haired, and choleric. His passion is for the British law, and he has spent a large fortune in litigation. He fights for the mere pleasure of fighting, and is equally ready to take up either side of a question, so that there is no wonder that he has found it a costly amusement. Sometimes he will shut up a right-of-way and defy the parish to make him open it. At others, he will, with his own hands, tear down some other man's gate and declare that a path has existed there from time immemorial, defying the owner to prosecute him for a trespass. He has learned in old manorial and communal rights, and he applies his knowledge sometimes in favor of the villagers of Fernworthy and sometimes against them, so that he is periodically either carried in triumph down the village street or else burned in effigy, according to his latest exploit. He is said to have been about seven lawsuits upon his hands at present, which will probably swallow up the remainder of his fortune, and so draw his string and leave him harmless for the future. Apart from the law, he seems a kindly good-natured person, and I only mention him because you are particular that I should send some descriptions of the people who surround us. He is curiously employed at present for being an amateur astronomer. He has an excellent telescope, with which he lies upon the roof of his own house and sweeps the moor all day in the hope of catching a glimpse of the escaped convict. If he would confine his energies to this, all would be well, but there are rumors that he intends to prosecute Dr. Mortimer for opening a grave without the consent of the next of kin because he dug up the skull in the barrow on Long Down. He hopes to keep our lives from being monotonous, monotonous, <laughs> and gives a little comic relief where it is badly needed. And now, having brought you up to date on the escaped convict, the Stapletons, Dr. Mortimer and Franklin of Laughter Hall, let me end on that which is most important and tell you more about the Barrymores and especially about the surprising development of last night. First of all, about the test telegram, which you sent from London in order to make sure the Barrymores were really here. I've already explained that the testimony of the postmaster shows that the test with wor was worthless, and that we have no proof one way or the other. I told Sir Henry how the matter stood, and he, at once, in his downright fashion, had Barrymore up and asked him whether he'd received the telegram himself. Barrymore said that he had. "'Did the boy deliver it into your own hands?' asked Sir Henry. Barrymore looked surprised and considered a little time. "'No,' said he. "'It was in the box. I was in the box room at the time, and my wife brought it up to me.' "'Did you answer it yourself?' "'No.' "'I told my wife what to answer, and she went down to write it.' In the evening, he recurred the subject of his own accord. I could not quite understand the object of your questions this morning, Sir Henry, he said. I trust that they do not mean that I have done anything to forfeit your confidence? Sir Henry had to assure him that it was not so, and pacify him by giving him a considerable part of his old wardrobe, the London outfit having now all arrived. Mrs. Barrymore is of interest to me. She is a heavy, solid person, very limited, intensely respectable and inclined to be puritanical. You could hardly conceive a less emotional subject. But I, yet I have told you how, on the first night here, I heard her sobbing bitterly. And since then I have more than once observed traces of tears upon her face. Some deep sorrow gnaws ever at her heart. Sometimes I wonder if she has a guilty memory which haunts her. And sometimes I suspect Barrymore of being a domestic tyrant. I've always felt that there was something singular and questionable in this man's character. But the adventures of last night bring all my suspicions to head, and yet it may seem a small matter in itself. You're aware that I'm not very sound a sleeper. 
And since I have been on guard in this house, my slumbers have been lighter than ever. Last night, at about two in the morning, I was aroused by a stealthy step passing my room. I rose, opened my door, and peeped out. A long black shadow was trailing down the corridor. It was thrown by a man who walked softly down the passage with a candle held in his hand. He was in shirt and trousers, with no covering to his feet. I could merely see the outline, but his height told me that it was Barrymore. He walked very slow and circumspectly, and there was something indescribably guilty and furtive to his whole appearance. I have told you that the corridor is broken by the balcony which runs down the hall, but that it is resumed upon the farther side. I waited until he had passed out of sight and then I followed him. When I came round the balcony, he had reached the end of the farther corridor, and I could see from the glimmer of light through an open door that he had entered one of the rooms. Now, all of these rooms are unfurnished and unoccupied, so that his expedition became more mysterious than ever. The light shone steadily, as if he were standing motionless. I crept down the passage as noiselessly as I could and peeped around the corner of the door. Barrymore was crouching at the window, with the candle held against the glass. His profile was half turned toward me, and his face seemed to be rigid with expectation as he stared out into the blackness of the moor. For some time, he stood watching intently. Then he gave a deep groan, and with an impatient gesture, he put out the light. Instantly, I made my way back to my room and very shortly came the stealthy steps, passing once more upon their return journey. Long afterwards, when I had fallen into a, light, into a light sleep, I heard a key turn somewhere in a lock, but I could not tell whence the sound came. What it all means I cannot guess, but there is some secret business going on in this house of gloom, which sooner or later we shall get to the bottom of. I do not trouble you with my theories, for you asked me to furnish you only with facts. I have had a long talk with Sir Henry this morning, and we have made a plan of campaign founded upon my observation of last night. I will not speak about it just now, but it should make my next report interesting reading. And that is the end of chapter eight. Woohoo!